Hey there, I'm Dr. Koshik Shah, Austin Urology Institute. Hey, I'm Dr. Lawrence Sai, also with Austin Urology Institute. So we decided to put together a series of uh, post-operative videos to kind of talk about the different surgeries and procedures we do here at Austin Urology Institute. So um, for some people, I think it's helpful to read through all the documentation, but for some people, it's helpful just to watch a video about the do's and don'ts of, about each of the procedures that we do. Yeah, yeah, you and I being you know very visual people along with others as well. Uh, we find out these, we hope that these videos are very helpful with guiding you through the whole process, you know, of surgery uh, for any of your urologic problems or conditions. Right. So what is the prostate and why is that so important to men's health? So the, the prostate is present in about 50% of the population. Uh, women do not have a prostate, but guys do. Um, the prostate is an organ that lives below the bladder. Um, it's about a, a, the size of a walnut for, for younger people, but as you age, that prostate continues to grow. Um, when you're younger, uh, the prostate is responsible for about 99% of the ejaculate volume. So 1% is sperm when you have an ejaculation, 99% is the uh, carrier fluid that comes from the prostate. So it's important for what I kind of say reproductive uh, baby making when you're younger, but as you get older, the prostate can continue to grow, causing urinary problems in some people, and yet in others, it can turn cancerous and you can develop prostate cancer. Uh, but for this particular um, segment, we're gonna talk about the HOLEP or holmium laser enucleation of the prostate. Um, so uh, in this situation, we're talking about people who have really massively enlarged prostates, way bigger than a walnut. Right, and as for, for BPH, there's a lot of treatments out there and a uh, holmium laser enucleation of the prostate or AKA HOLEP mm -hmm. is one of the many that are offered uh, with Austin Urology Institute and something that uh, can help patients quality of life and also control their symptoms with BPH. And what is BPH? All right, so, so BPH stands for benign prostatic hyperplasia. Uh, for short, you know, stands for BPH, but it's another, uh, another word or name that it's known as is also enlarged prostate. And kind of like what Dr. Shaw just mentioned earlier, uh, a large prostate is something that affects most men starting at age 40. And you know, depending on who you are, uh, symptoms can vary from mild to moderate. Um, and BPH is something that tends to stick with a guy for the majority of your lifetime. And um, you know, the older you get, the worse your symptoms may be. And so while, while Dr. Shaw and I, we get wrinkles and gray hairs as we, as we age, the prostate itself doesn't do that. It, uh, instead enlarges and sometimes to the point where it starts causing symptoms uh, like frequent urination, waking up at night uh, to urinate, uh, whenever you go, you know, feeling like you have a weakened stream or, you know, when you're done urinating, feeling like you're still uh, full and not feeling like you're completely empty whenever you go. Um, other symptoms you may have would you know, maybe frequency or feeling like you're urinating way too often, or sometimes having these all of a sudden intense urge to have to use the restroom and uh, occasionally having some uh, leakage uh, in the whole process as well. Did anyone say dribbling down your pants? Yeah, that too? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and you know, BPH is something that's very present in a lot of men. And the fact of the matter is, you know, despite it being so present, not a lot of guys like to talk about it for obvious reasons. But, you know, this is something we see every day and we're very comfortable with, you know, talking to patients about it as well. Speaking of which, you know, if, if you're the guy, you know, maybe guys don't talk about it, but, you know, you're, you're playing a round of golf with your friends and you're that guy that's always in the bushes, you know, and you have a reference range of what your friends are doing, but you're that guy who's got to go, got to go, pushing and straining. Uh, you're at the movie theater, I mean, it's a classic one where you're getting up and down multiple times during the movie, but your spouse or friend is not, you know, that could be a sign that there's there's some issues there. Yeah, definitely. And, and BPH is something where it's, uh, you know, separate from prostate cancer. But what we find is that whenever you have BPH and it starts uh, getting worse, it really se severely impacts people's quality of life. And that, that's kind of the biggest thing here. You know, when you have BPH, how bothersome is it? And, you know, to what point to where it's time to say, you know, you need to look into this further and then seek treatment for it. And when I educate my patients, you know, like we talked about this prostate being a walnut you know, sized gland, there's like small, medium, mm -hmm. large, and then there's XXL. 
And I tell people, you know, if it's mild, you know, urinary issues, you can take soft palmetto, you can try to reduce your Cokes, coffees, and teas. If it's a little bit more significant, uh, you know, there's medications that obviously can help. If it's more than that, there are some procedures that can be beneficial. Uh, but then the procedure that you are an expert at, the HOLEP, is I call it, it's for those large and XXL prostates. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, definitely. And, and, what we t and when we talk about BPH treatments, you know, everything runs on a spectrum from mild to severe and from small to large. Uh, regarding homium laser nucleation of the prostate or HOLEP, it's specifically designed for prostates that are on the very large end and for very severe symptoms. And um, what the procedure is essentially is a combination of two parts. Uh, the first part involves enucleating uh, the prostate or kind of coring the prostate out. And then the second part involves having to retrieve the prostate that you've kind of freed off uh, from the capsule. And that's the morselation or extraction portion. Uh, the procedure is something that is done uh, requiring an overnight stay, uh, but it's about a two to three hour procedure and it's minimally invasive in the sense that there's no incisions required and it's all done through your natural orifice known as your urethra. Um, during the enucleation portion of the surgery, uh, if you think of the prostate as an analogy of an orange with a fruit and a peel, the enucleation portion essentially frees off the fruit portion of the prostate and then takes it off of the capsule, which is essentially the peel. And so what you're left behind is just this uh, hollow shell that, that's uh, intimate with your urine and your urethra that helps you create this nice channel for you to urinate through or pee through. Mm -hmm. And I do want to let you know that no oranges were injured or hurt during the making of this video. Exactly. Except it's strictly an analogy. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Um, yeah, and rest assured, there's no oranges left inside you at the time of surgery <laughs> either. <clears throat> right. And, you know, the, the, the brilliant thing about this is um, it, it's all done through the urethra, the urine tube. It's all under anesthesia, so you don't feel any of this exactly. is all being done while you're asleep. Um, and, uh, you know, looking at the data, you know, there is that TURP, the rotor rooter, the procedure mm -hmm. that I do, which I think is almost rendered old fashioned now. It seems like a lot of the data and the clinical information that continues to come out shows that this is really superior uh, versus the TRP for the appropriate patient, right? Yeah, definitely. And uh, the, the data that's out there right now that's looking at HOLEP versus other BPS treatments like the TRP or a rotor rooter suggests that patients get very good durability from this. And so um, traditionally, you know, if you see a man or a patient who's had BPH and has had a TRP or TERP, after about five or seven years or so, on average, uh, they may start noticing a return of their symptoms. Um, and you know, when you go back in and do a and and look in and and kind of interrogate what's going on, you find that the prostate tissue has grown back from after being cut out. And because of the nature of the hole up, where you're removing the entirety of the prostate that's responsible for your urinary symptoms. The durability rates looking at up to 18 or 20 years is up to, you know, is 99%, meaning, you know, out of 2,000 patients in one study, one patient only needed a repeat procedure uh, because of their symptoms returning. And even so, that one patient had scar tissue, which was unrelated to the prostate growing back. Yeah. And so when we talk about the whole of being the new gold standard, um, you know, it's for all intents and purposes, we. I usually tell most patients it's it's a one and done procedure where right. you know you get the prostate taken care of you don't have to worry about it you know for the rest of your life potentially and i think you know I, you've uh, outstaged me on this because of the trp which i've done and has been done historically for decades the transurethral resection of the prostate uh, i tell my patients that i'm going to give you if you look at this as a warranty or guarantee mm -hmm. I, i'm giving you about a seven year warranty mm -hmm. on the trp before there's about a 10% likelihood one out of 10 is going to need a repeat surgery. So if you look at the TRP or any of these procedures as a haircut, you're removing some of the prostate tissue that grows. I've given you a haircut, but there's a 10% 10, 10 chance within seven years you need a repeat haircut. So what you're telling us is with the hole up, you're removing so much tissue, there is a low likelihood that you'll ever need another procedure in your lifetime. Exactly, so you know, the I guess a good analogy to the haircut would be, you know, after we shaved everything off, 
we're putting on some wax and then waxing mm -hmm. the rest of the hair fall and pulls out. So you're bald, so, baby. Yeah, you're bald. You're completely <laughs> bald. So, okay. <laughs> so, uh, no, that's great. And, and you know what's impressive is even on the TRPs, and I'm comparing your procedure to mine, you know, I would leave my catheter in for a couple of days and, you know, the blood in the urine and clots and things like that. Um, it seems like you've got the, the catheter comes out the very next day and you're done. Yeah, yeah. So uh, traditionally what, what happened, you know, when you get a procedure like a TRP or something else like a simple prostatectomy or a robotic simple prostatectomy is that the time it would take for you to keep a catheter after surgery can, you know, range anywhere from two, two days to a whole week. And uh, mainly the issue is because of the problems with bleeding or maybe patients weren't able to urinate immediately mm -hmm. after because things were swollen. Uh, with the nature of the hole up, because you're kind of, you're, you're addressing the whole situation, taking everything out, I find that a good percentage of my patients that following day, that morning, you know, the urine looks good, we fill them up with water and to their bladder, and then we take the catheter out and they're able to urinate immediately. Even patients who've had catheters for a long period of time, and you know, it was thought that maybe that they would have to have a catheter for the rest of their lives. We've done the whole procedure on them, and just like the rest of the patients, the next morning, once you take the catheter out, they're able to pee for the first time in, you know, mm -hmm. five, ten years. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I've watched you take care of a handful of our uh, problem children within our practice, some <laughs> patients with you know horrifically enlarged prostates, people that were self catheterizing couldn't completely empty. You've done that procedure and they've gone on to do incredibly well. So it's pretty impressive. Um, now, the other thing too is, is um, with the, the, um, the HOLAP, um, if it's so great, and I'm looking at the literature, wow, if you look at the data, it's a superior procedure versus the TRP in terms of recurrence rates of, uh, of tissue needing to redo the procedure complications, it's superior. Um, but then you look around as like, why isn't everyone doing it? And, 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 you know, watching you do it, it seems like it's a pretty technically sophisticated procedure. It is. And, uh, the, that's, that's a very good observation. And the, the biggest, the two biggest reasons why the whole is not as widespread as something like the TRP or other, uh, prostate procedures is that there's a bit of a steep learning curve behind mm -hmm. it. And if you couple that with, the number of training programs in the United States that teach the whole up mm -hmm. that makes it a fairly rare procedure. And so there's there's only a handful of large institutions like Cleveland Clinic, Mayo Clinic that teach the whole up procedure. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate enough to train under one of my mentors that, that I came from there, uh, those institutions. And in addition to you know the rarity of training or the access to the training for the whole up, it's been said that it takes roughly 100 to 150 procedures to really make uh, acquaint yourself with being comfortable with doing the whole man laser and nucleation of the prostate. And you know, in reality, it's if you're trying to hit that number, if you're an institution that doesn't necessarily do the whole up, mm -hmm. uh, it's very hard to to get those numbers under your belt. Got it. Um, the other limiting factor with the whole, uh, the whole up procedure, in addition to the learning curve and the training, is equipment. And uh, it takes a whole host of specialized equipments and scopes and lasers to be able to do this procedure very well and efficiently. Mm -hmm. And some hospitals, institutions, you know, are just aren't very well equipped for it. Right, right. And so, you know, here we were fortunate enough to have a, you know, hospital system that supports us that's able to provide the equipment, the cutting edge equipment that we need. And, you know, right. coupling that with the, me being very, very fortunate to have the training on the whole of, you know, is, is somewhat of a rarity to be able to bring that to Austin. Yeah, and I, th I think uh, they invested almost a quarter million dollars oh, yeah. of equipment just for you. And uh, I was told once that if uh, you can back it up, it ain't bragging. So this guy can back <laughs> it up. Uh, so, so that's great. Um, uh, lasers. Um, Austin Powers famously love lasers. Lasers make people very excited. Other people very scared. What's so awesome about the the Holmium laser, and why is it why is it so great? Right. So the the Holmium laser uh, has a few advantages uh, compared to other lasers. One is that its depth of penetrance is so shallow, meaning as you're working on the prostate the amount of energy that's being sent through the laser doesn't penetrate through the capsule of the prostate. And as we know from anatomy, the prostate with relation to nerves and blood vessels that are uh, in the area that are responsible for things like erectile function, mm -hmm. um, when 
using the homeum laser, uh, you're able to avoid those critical structures that are responsible for things like erections uh, and also continence too. Uh, the other advantage of the homeum laser is that it is fine-tuned to deal directly with the prostate tissue and to leave everything else alone, meaning uh, you can cut on the prostate tissue with almost relative impunity and it, it, it'll leave the surrounding structures alone fairly well. The other advantage to the homeum laser is its ability to control bleeding. Mm -hmm. And uh, the bane of any surgeon's existence is bleeding, right? And whenever we have a patient who comes in who's on blood thinners, you know, the, the protocol is to try to get them to maybe hold it in, uh, with enough time so they can have their surgery and then a little bit afterwards so they can restart their blood thinners to avoid any excess bleeding as a complication of surgery. Well, the homeum laser, uh, the way it's designed is that it can actually be done on patients who have that increased risk of bleeding because of its excellent effect on cauterization and what we call hemostasis, meaning its ability to control bleeding. Coupling the technology of the laser with how the hole-up is done, uh, that actually provides a very good outcome for patients who need a prostate procedure but can't hold their uh, anticoagulation or blood thinner medications. Got it. So if you're on Plavix or Coumadin or any of these uh, blood thinners, you can still do this procedure exactly. safely. Yep. And I'm not calling you an idiot, but you're pretty much saying this homium laser is idiot proof. You're not going to blast through the, the nerves, the capsule. Uh, it, it coagulates the tissue. So it's, it's, a, it's a great laser. It's a great laser, and, and, a, and the caveat is, you know, the, the analogy is a butter knife can't cut through too much, but if you really force your way with a butter knife, you can do some damage. So uh, not necessarily idiot proof, but fairly safe okay. with the right hands. Well, good, good. So um, now walk me through your procedure, you know, from, from A to Z, uh, from the time someone walks into the office, hey, I've got urinary problems. What does that workup look like? What are the different tests that you do? Why are you doing them? Sure, yeah. um, what happens the day of surgery? And and, uh, and then walk me through what happens after. Yeah, definitely. So as far as the preoperative workup, you know, whenever a patient first comes into our office with possible BPH symptoms, uh, we'll do a careful exam, a careful history, and kind of get a good glimpse, get a good idea of what your symptoms are like starting out. And then depending on where you're at with the with your treatment, with your BPH journey, sometimes it may be as simple as us just trying you on a medication first to see how well you do. Uh, and the, but the, the key with that is to having the appropriate follow-up. So if you're a brand new patient who thinks they have BPH, we may try you on a medication for a few weeks or, or a month and then have you return to see how your symptoms are. And then at, at that follow-up appointment, if the symptoms are improved, but you realize may, maybe medications aren't really my thing or the medications themselves aren't working, we do further testing. And uh, that testing can be either in the form of something called a Eurocuff test, which essentially is a test to measure how well your bladder is squeezing or how strong it's squeezing. Uh, this test also tells us whether or not uh, your stream is strong and then whether or not you're emptying your bladder well. And the way I've, I tell most patients is that this test is a fairly good gauge of your bladder health because there are some men who, you know, because of their prostate, their bladder is not in a very good health because it's been squeezing and working overtime just to get urine past a large prostate. So that's the Eurocup test. And that provides a, a pretty good picture of the function of everything that's going on with your urinary system down there. Uh, the second test that we do is something called cystoscopy, where it's essentially a camera procedure that allows us to examine anything and everything from the tip of your urethra and into your bladder. And in doing this test, it gives us a good idea of one, how big your prostate is, and then also how big it is and how it's configured. And then by the, the end of this testing period, we'll, we're usually able to sit down with the patient and say, based off of these findings, this, you know, this BPH procedure may be better for you compared to this one. And that's kind of the beauty with what we do here is that not everyone's the same and we're mm -hmm. able to tailor uh, the type of treatment you may need for your BPH to you. And, and so a hole up, you know, at the, at the end of this testing is usually suggested if your prostate is known to be very large mm -hmm. or if your symptoms are so bad that, you know, you need something a little bit more extensive compared to medications or your lip or resume or something that's more, uh, I guess, minimally invasive. 
And sometimes with that workup, you might find out, hey, that one butter knife doesn't work for all procedures. Exactly. And maybe the patient's got a stricture or narrowing of the urethra and it's not prostate enlargement at all, right? Exactly, yeah. Or sometimes in the process of doing the workup, we find out, oh, you've got a bladder tumor mm -hmm. as well as enlarged prostate. So sometimes we get, you know, we find additional information that we have to tailor our, our management, right? Exactly. And, you know, and oftentimes it's maybe something as simple as just a UTI or a urinary tract infection that we treat with antibiotics mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden their symptoms are completely gone. So, mm -hmm. you know, with the sound of hooves sounding more like horses than zebras, we'll kind of rule out all the horses first before we proceed to, you know, diagnosing someone with a zebra. Okay. That way. And do you do prostate ultrasounds sometimes as well? We do, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so prostate ultrasounds is another testing that we may do. And the ultrasound gives us a fairly good idea of how big the prostate is. Mm -hmm. And then it also will tell us if there's something called a median lobe, which in some men, uh, it's a part of the prostate that kind of resembles a tongue that kind of sticks its <laughs> way into the bladder. Okay. And can sometimes cause blockage that way too. It's like a ball valve. Exactly. Uh, it has a little thing. bit of a ball valve effect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now uh, say you've gone through the hoops, uh, done the uricuff, cystoscopy, ultrasound, um, the whole up is the right procedure for me. Uh, what's that next step look like? All right, so the, at that point, we, we talk about setting you up for the procedure and the whole up, and that's something that we typically do at a uh, surgery center or a surgery hospital. And once our schedules get in touch with you and get a date down, uh, they'll typically have you arrive the day of surgery. Uh, get all the preoperative things that need to be done uh, with IE tests, IVs put in and set up. And then we'll meet you in the morning and get you signed in. Uh, the, the actual whole procedure can take anywhere from one to three hours. And it's a bit different for everyone depending on your prostate size and you know how much is involved. Mm -hmm. uh, and most patients will typically stay with us overnight in the hospital. Uh, you'll have a catheter immediately after the surgery just to allow us to kind of wash any blood clots or anything that may develop out. And the following morning when we check on you, uh, if everything looks very good, we'll typically take the catheter out and give men a chance to urinate at that time. Mm -hmm. And I'd say that 95% of gentlemen who undergo this procedure uh, usually are discharged home without a catheter by noon, mm -hmm. the day after surgery. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna pretend I'm a, a, a guy who's going through this procedure. Mm -hmm. Questions I have for you, uh, is do you listen to music while you're operating? We do, yeah, yeah. And I personally jump between 80s uh, music and then classic rock. Okay, can yeah. patients request their own music? You can, you can. We've had okay. a guy, uh, we've had a gentleman request death metal. Um, <laughs> it definitely okay. made me go a little bit faster, maybe. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but okay. you, know, you can request whatever music you like. Okay, so you, you usually uh, the two hours plus or minus for the surgery itself. Um, you're in the recovery room and then usually we're at the um, at one of our uh, St. David's hospitals exactly, and yeah. that place is like a Four Seasons hotel so people love it out there. Yeah so in addition uh -huh. to the amenities being great uh, the the staff that we have there and, and the equipment that we have there is top-notch and the team that uh, I work with for the whole up in the operating room and outside the hot operating room with the nurses that are taking care of patients they all are very well versed with the procedure. They know all the protocols, what we do, and they're exceptional. Yeah, and patients, in, in just one of the, the hardest things about being a urologist is everyone hates catheters. And mm -hmm. the brilliant thing is you're saying in the vast majority of cases, the catheter comes out the very next day. Exactly. So yeah. you're done. Um, is it painful? Are people using a lot of narcotics? Is it, is it the worst thing ever? Or yeah, what that's, is that that's like? a great question. So um, the only, Complaints I've had from patients are just so from a little bit of discomfort from the catheter site. Uh -huh. uh, but anecdotally speaking, all of my patients postoperatively have not had any pain or have required very little, if any, pain medications, including narcotics after their surgery. Uh huh. Okay. Um, and uh, and afterwards. Um, urinary urgency, frequency, dribbling, like is it perfect right after I walk out of the hospital in terms of urination, or is there a, a pathway to slowly regaining excellent urinary function? That's a good question. So what I, well, whenever we counsel patients, we, I wanna be completely transparent and let them know that you know, despite this being a great procedure, uh, most of the work or heavy lifting, so to speak, happens after 
the surgery and it, it's usually on the patient to kind of recover well and the process could be fairly fast uh, but in some men it may take a while depending on how big the prostate was or where their symptoms were like mm -hmm. and so generally speaking for the first two weeks after your whole procedure you're going to have some degree of blood in the urine which is going to be normal you may have some increased symptoms like frequency and some urgency but typically after the two week mark, you'll start noticing things getting better. Mm -hmm. And then for the majority of men, by six weeks or so, symptoms will improve. Mm -hmm. And you'll be getting towards that new baseline, that new normal for you. Okay. Um, with that said, you know, it also depends on your symptoms before you undergo the procedure. So if you're a man that had BPH, but your main symptom was weak stream, you may notice that immediately after your whole procedure, your stream is great and you're not bothered anymore. But if your symptoms were more so dealing with urgency or frequency, which are usually tied with the bladder and how it's acting, it can take up to one, two, or even three months for the bladder to realize that the prostate's no longer there and kind of reacclimate itself to its surroundings. Got it. So I tell people it's sort of like knee surgery. You're not running right afterwards. You got to go through re rehab and, you know, and it takes a while before you're walking and running again. So, so, that it's, so it's a little bit of a pathway to, to getting better. Um, one big question on the top of every man's mind, I think we think about it about seven times an hour, is sex, right? Right. Right. Yeah. Like we could be thinking about that right now as we're doing this video. Is so when can you have sex after the, the procedure? Right. So I wouldn't recommend it if you have a catheter in place. And if you do manage that, then that's very impressive. I know a guy that tried in New Orleans once. <laughs> True. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, but well, what I typically tell most guys is that because of the decrease uh, or the the lack of sexual side effects after the whole up, it's probably gonna be more tied with, with when you feel like you're up for it. So, uh, you know, your symptoms may be worsened in the first two weeks and during mm -hmm. that period where, you know, you're urinating blood or having more frequent urges to use a restroom, you you may not be up for it as well. But, you know, it's, I every, man, every man's a little bit different and I usually advise them it's whenever you're feeling up for it. Um, okay. It is important after the surgery because of where your prostate once was and it's removed that, you know, even though you're not seeing any incisions, a lot of stuff has happened under the hood, so to speak. And so decreasing the amount of straining and limiting the amount of lifting or straining is very important, in the, particularly in the first six weeks to decrease the risk of bleeding or uh, any other complications. Got it. And then um, in, in, in a lot of studies, they suggest that after you're urinating better, erectile function actually improves mm -hmm. versus, you know, uh, that it's compromised after surgery. So as I understand it, the whole app, there's no real impacts, negative impacts on erectile function or orgasm. Mm -hmm. So you'll still have erectile function, if not even slightly improved, mm -hmm. you'll still have this sensation of the orgasm, mm -hmm. but you may notice a decreased ejaculate. Exactly. So, right? so because the prostate is <clears throat> part of a mechanism that helps propel your ejaculate forward, you know, as you can imagine, once you remove the prostate, uh, that may be a bit disrupted. And what I do counsel patients on uh, preoperatively before they agree to go with the whole up is ask them the question is how important is it for you to ejaculate normally? Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is you're still able to climax, but after you've undergone the whole up, similar to a TURP, you may experience something called retrograde ejaculation. And what that means is you're still able to climax normally and you may have some ejaculate come out, but rather than come out and shoot out by the normally does, it may actually go up into the bladder temporarily until you urinate it out. Later. Is that harmful? Like that backup of sperm in your bladder? Absolutely not. No, no okay. absolutely not. And in fact, some patients are actually happy because that's less of a cleanup situation mm -hmm. whenever they enter it. So someone once said is that your toes will still curl but you can't have babies afterwards, right? Would exactly. that be accurate? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay, all right, cool. Um, anything else that we need to know about the procedure, things to watch out for, things to be scared about, things to look forward to? Right, so it, you know, with all things said, this is still a procedure and it's, you know, it's a surgery. And the most important thing is a patient's overall health. And so prior to scheduling a patient for surgery, you know, we, we do ask for clearance sometimes from your primary doctor. And then above all else, we want to make sure that this is the right procedure for you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if the holop is not something that's meant for <clears> you, <throat> uh, we have a whole host of other options and other treatments available here. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the most important thing, making sure that we're pairing the right surgery, the right procedure with the right patient. Mm -hmm. And you kind of said that there was a handful of people that are really experts 
in this procedure around the country. Um, and some of them are in academic centers where it's hard to get to the academic center, say UT Southwestern or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I know you've had a couple people drive from around Texas to get here. We've got hotels here on campus, so people could drive or fly in, right? Yeah, in exactly. So with where we're located, uh, we're, we're right by major toll roads and highways, and Austin being a big hub for travel, uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's very easy for people to fly in. Uh, we have patients who are flying in from, you know, all over the country, and then even out of the country, uh, like Mexico and, you know, Canada, places like that. And so it's in addition to being able to offer it in a major city like Austin, we have a lot of patients who are able to travel mm -hmm. uh, to Austin as a big hub, you know, mm -hmm. get their surgery done, recover, maybe even stay and enjoy the city for a little bit before they fly out. Okay. Uh, last question is, you're a guy that likes sweets apparently, so you don't even want to get paid for these procedures. Mm -hmm. I, I, someone brought you f uh, fresh homemade fudge yesterday. Yeah. So tell our, our, our viewers your top three sweets that you'd like to get paid with. Uh, in lieu of, uh, of money for this procedure. Exactly. So, so number one, <laughs> gummy bears, okay, gummy worms, and then gummy sharks. But I'd okay. imagine if you if enough patients pay me with that enough, okay. they may they're not there may not be a urologist that does the whole up in Austin soon because he would have died of diabetic complications. Okay, so. well, good to know. Gummies, gummies, and gummies is how this guy wants to get paid. Exactly. So. Okay, um, anything else that we need to know about this procedure? Uh, if there's any questions at all, uh, you know, the staff here and us at Austin Urology Institute are available uh, to answer any questions. Uh, we take pride in being accessible to our patients. And, you know, any issues, questions, concerns, uh, we are available almost 24-7 to be able to address people's issues. He's available 24-7. I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's all. That's it. All right. Good.